Corinthians chapter number 11. We'll continue our study in the book of 1 Corinthians and chapter number 11 this morning. Praise God for a wonderful week. And uh, I've heard so much preaching this week that I'm just plumb full. I feel like I've been to the Golden Corral all week long. And I just, they've just so much there, man. You know, you get a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I feel like I've just, I've ate till I've nearly burst spiritually. I'm gorged full. I'm, I feel like I'm just sitting up under the shade tree, just satisfied, full. And the Bible said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. The Bible said, newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. Oh, I like that word. And uh, I appreciate all that good preaching we heard this week and the good singing. And uh, if you wasn't able to make it out uh, to any of the services or if you made it out to some and wasn't able to make it out to all of them or maybe missed the morning services, I, honest to goodness, would encourage you. I promise it'll help you. Encourage you either to go back and go to our Facebook page or Open Doors Facebook page. All the services are on there morning and night. Watch them all on there and listen to them, you know. And you, uh, with your ear pods in or whatever, or turn it on in your car to listen to it over your computer. Or you can get with Brother Nathan and Brother Dale and get copies of all the CDs. But I promise you it'll be a real help and a blessing to you. And uh, I appreciate God's men being used mightily to speak to our heart. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 this morning. Two weeks ago, we started uh, in this chapter. And uh, we were looking at the order of the church. And we'll continue looking at the order of the church this morning. That goes all the way from verse 1 down to around verse number 16. And then next week, we'll look at the ordinance of the church, which is the Lord's Supper. And then we'll get into the ordeal in this church here in a few weeks. But this morning, we'll continue in the order of the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, let's read these first four verses again. We commented on them two weeks ago. And we'll pick up where we left off down around verse 4 and verse 5. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul said, Be ye followers of me even as I also am of Christ. We commented on that two weeks ago, how that all of the new Bibles changed that to be imitators. God's not called us to be imitators, and imitation is a fake of the real thing. We're not called to be imitators. We are called to be followers of Christ, followers of those, Paul said in Hebrews, of who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Verse 2, Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances. We looked up that word ordinance. It simply means the traditions. There are some good traditions. Uh, any tradition that does not contradict Scripture and is scriptural tradition is wonderful. But to be like the Pharisees that Jesus reprimanded them because their tradition trumped the Scriptures uh, should be thrown out. Any tradition that is put above the Word of God ain't worth having this morning. Uh, we, want, we want to live in the context of the Bible. He said, keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you, verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, and the head of, the Christ, and the head of Christ is God. We commented on that as well. Verse 4, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth, uh, his head. We talked about that's a tradition that many people do and don't even know why they do it. They go to praying uh, or something sacred goes on, whether it be uh, preaching or the national anthem starts, and immediately every man in the place pull his hat off and put it over his heart. Uh, that comes right out of a King James Bible. A lot of people do it and have no idea why they do it. It comes out of the Bible. Uh, verse 5, now we're going to move on from the man uh, to the woman here. And he says, But every man that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. Now, here uh, in the text, uh, Paul is dealing with head covering for a woman. And what is this head covering? Obviously, we're going to find in the text it could be some sort of hat or something like that. But specifically what Paul's dealing with is down in verse 15. Look at verse 15. The Scripture always interprets the Scripture. Look at what he says in verse 15. Uh, if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for 
a covering. So when Paul is talking about a covering, he is talking about the long hair of a woman is her glory, and it is her covering. And we'll mention more about this as we move down in the text. We'll just comment on them as they go. It said in verse 5, Every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. Now, let me just pause right here and clear up maybe some misconception on prophecy. Because uh, some people would run through here and say, see there, preacher, a woman can preach too. A man praying and prophesying, verse 4. A woman praying and prophesying in verse 5. See there, women can preach just like men. But the word prophecy does not always imply preaching. Uh, in the text, the word prophecy literally means this as well. The word prophecy means to utter or declare a thing known uh, only by divine revelation means something the Lord spoke to your heart about and you share it with somebody. Or to break forth into lofty discourse or praise of something about the divine, about the Lord. So essentially, we use different terminology. We, we call it testifying. But that's essentially what this is. When a lady stands up in the church and says, Preacher, I'd like to give a word of testimony. Essentially what you're doing is, according to the Bible, it's called prophecy. You are giving something, a, a, a revelation, if you will, that God spoke to your heart about. Maybe you saw something or read something in the scripture and God helped you with it. You said, preacher, I just want to thank the Lord for, or I just want to share what God did with me this week. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I've been to some churches and I know some preachers that they go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 where it says let your women keep silence in the churches. And they, man, they don't let, they don't let women testify. They don't let women sing. They don't, I mean, you, you, don't, you, you just sit down, shut, shut up and hold on. But I don't believe that's Bible. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 where it says, let your women keep silence in the church and we'll get there down the road. 1 Corinthians 14 is the tongues chapter in the Bible. Talking about speaking in tongues in a different tongue when the Holy Ghost came upon them. Now, when it comes to tongues, it was absolutely forbidden for women to speak in tongues. And that's funny, too, because everybody you see speaking in tongues today, which we know that's an apostolic gift that's passed away, it's mostly women that do it anyway. But when it comes to testifying or prophesying, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a lady standing up, giving a word of testimony, just like any man standing up giving a word of testimony. Anyways, every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. We know that her head is the man. Uh, now, here's the context. Read what it's saying. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. In other words, if, if a lady is trying to pray or prophesy, stand up and give a testimony, and she looks just like the man does, then that's dishonoring the man. There ought to be some distinction between them. Verse 6, For if the woman be not covered, if she doesn't have long hair or hair that is distinctive to a lady, uh, let her also be shorn. The word shorn is where they get the word for like shearing sheep, be cut it close. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, then let her be covered. In other words, if she doesn't have any hair and her hair's all shaved off and she's bald, then put a little hat on. Uh, this is some, I'll be honest with you, these next seven or eight verses here, uh, there's some sticky wickets in here, and I'm just going to give them to you as they come. But there's some real um, sticky passages in here, especially when we start dealing with... Um, with American churches and things of that nature that's different from where uh, Paul is coming from. Uh, here in verse number 6, it talks about if a woman was to testify or prophesy or pray and didn't have her hair in the right shape or didn't have a head covering on her head. You see a lot. That's where that here tradition, once again, uh, white people don't keep it much anymore. But if y'all have ever been to a, a black church, Y'all ever y'all notice when they, all them ladies go in, they wear them big old hats. That's where you know it kind of got deviated. It kind of got deviated. All of a sudden, now it's like a fashion thing. But that's where it come from. It was it was a picture of submission. It was a picture of matter of fact. We preached in Germany uh, four years ago. Me and my wife, I was over there preaching, and uh, and Brother Weimer and them. There, all the ladies in their church wear hats. And <laughs> y'all know my wife. They <laughs> y'all know how Tristan is. She particular about. It how she's going to look or whatever and such as that. And uh, <laughs> Miss Weimer, she come to Tristan, wanted to give Tristan one of these little hats that they was wearing. And she said, here, you want to wear this hat? And Tristan was like, no, I'm good. <laughs> I, 
I, I got my hair. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I got my hair. She's like, well, we all wear hats. Well, God bless you. My husband didn't tell me I had to wear one, so I ain't wearing one. <laughs> uh, she, all week long, they was wearing them hats. I want Tristan to wear it. Tristan come back to the room. She said, Zorn, I ain't wearing one of them hats. I said, yes, you are too. <laughs> she didn't wear one. <laughs> but anyways, but they have that tradition. That's fine if that's in their church and that's what they want to do. God bless them. But I believe in the context of the scripture, it's dealing more with hair than actually wearing a hat uh, such as that. Now, we'll, we'll get into to the thought about the hair here, but obviously in verse 6, it says, if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Um, even you go back to Numbers chapter 5, if you was to write this reference down, you can read Numbers chapter 5 and verse number 18. If a man thought his wife had committed adultery on him under the law, she would take him before the priest. And the Bible said the priest would uncover her head. And when it says uncover her head, it's not talking about taking a veil off or taking a shawl off. It literally means he's, he shaved her head. Uh, to let everybody know this woman was shamed because she was caught in the act of adultery. Um, it, it, that, it, it was... It, it, Look at here for for a lady to have her head just absolutely. That's why it's always been been breaks my heart any time that I've ever seen ladies that have to go through chemotherapy with cancer. I think one of the hardest things for any lady to deal with when they go through chemotherapy or radiation is when they lose their hair, um, because there's something glorious and distinctive to you ladies about your hair. Uh, it's the glory it says of the woman. And even in Nazi Germany, when they rounded all them Jews up and put them in them concentration camps, you know the first thing they done to every woman? You can look at pictures of it. The first thing they did to every woman there to shame them and try and demean them is they shaved their heads totally bald. Um, that's, it, was a, it was a form of shame trying to do it to them. Anyways, verse number 7. Uh, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. Now we're talking about hair. You say, well now... We're talking about covering hair, yeah, but it's talking about length now because it goes down here later on, talks about a man have long hair, a woman have long hair. Men, you've got a covering, it's your head, but it's not a covering like what the ladies got because of the length of it. Anyways, um, if a man indeed ought not to cover, a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. Uh, but the woman is the glory of the man. Let me pause right there and say something. Ain't the Bible an amazing book? I mean, a lot of people just think the Bible is just, you know, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, and the Bible is just, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But here we're going to read about the apostle to the Gentiles, and he goes uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And there are about 13 verses dealing with hair. <laughs> I mean, it, gets, it just cuts it right down. Isn't that funny? I mean, some people think the Bible is just the Lord's my shepherd and I shall not want. I mean, it gets right down even to talking about hair in the church. That's, that's a wild thing, man. It, that book's all up in your business. That's why people hate the Bible. It gets right up, right in your face, man. But anyways, there's something interesting in verse 7 here. It said, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. Now, it's dealing with a saved man. Obviously, we know that in the context because it talks about this man, verse 4, he prays or prophesies. So it's talking about a saved man. A lost man doesn't pray or prophesy, not in a way that God recognizes anyway. And it says here, this saved man is the image and glory of God. Do y'all realize when God made man, he made Adam in the image of God? Remember reading that in Genesis chapter 1, I think it's around verse 27. It said God made him in his own likeness, in his own image. God made him in the image of God. You say, what image is that? Well, he made him body, soul, and spirit. That's what God is. God's a body, Jesus Christ. God's a soul, God the Father. No man's seen God at any time. And God's a spirit, the Holy Spirit. God made you a three-part being just like him. He was made in God's image. And if we even wanted to get deeper than that, the Bible said Christ is the image of God. I believe Adam looked just like Jesus Christ. He didn't just make him body, soul, spirit. He looked just like the Lord. Uh, anyways, <clears throat> but you know what happens in the garden? Adam sins and falls. And the Lord told him, in the day you eat of that fruit, you're going to die. Now, Adam ate the fruit, but he didn't die. He kept living. But something died in him. What died in him? His spirit died. 
The spiritual side of man that communes with God died that day. And the Bible said when Adam has a son, you read it for yourself, it's not by coincidence. Genesis chapter 5 said when Adam had his son, he had a son in his own likeness and his own image. Every son that Adam has after the fall is not in the image of God, it's in the image of Adam. And the Bible said in 1 Corinthians 15, As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Do you realize everybody that's been born into this world since the fall of Adam was not made in the image of God? Contrary to what every politician and preacher and speaker say, man is made in the image of God. No, the first man was made in the image of God. But every man after that, you know what you're made in the image of? A fallen, depraved, wicked, sinful, spiritually dead human being. That's the image you're made in. But watch what it said here. This saved man said he is the image and glory of God. You know what happens? When you get saved, you get back what Adam lost. Because Jesus Christ moves in. And the Bible said, you hath he quickened, made alive. You hath he quickened who were dead. Adam died. Were dead in trespass and sin. When you all got saved, you know what you got? You got back the part that died in Adam. And the Holy Spirit of God moves in and brings back the fellowship that was severed and broken all the way back yonder in the Garden of Eden. You get, you get the Bible said this, Colossians 1.27, you get Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is the image of God. You regain the image. He gets in you. And you're going to even get the image better than that. Because the Bible said, Beloved, uh, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, 1 John 3, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. We get everything back that Adam lost and more in Jesus Christ. And so he says here, This man is the image and glory of God. You get saved, you get the image back. All right, look at the last part. But the woman, going all the way back to the garden, is the glory of the man. Now he gives context here. Let's read these next couple of verses and I'll go back and comment on that woman being the glory of man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Verse 9, neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man this morning. So it said the man, the image and glory of God, but the woman's the glory of the man. Do you realize you want to know how you end up in a messed up society? I'm going to tell you how the Bible said in Romans chapter 1, they changed the glory of God and they started worshiping themselves. They started worshiping the creature and not the creator. You want to know how you know you're in a messed up society? When everything that you see gives glory to man. You say, how's that? You women come out of a man. You come out of the rib of the man. And when a society starts promoting ladies in sexual ways in everything, you know you're in a messed up society, you ain't giving glory to God, you're giving glory to yourself. Have y'all noticed how you can't see one commercial on TV? I don't care what they're selling. I don't care if they're selling Johnson's foot powder. That they don't put some scantily clad woman right on the smack dab on it to try. You know what that is? That's grabbing something that's from the man and you giving glory to yourself. Lifting up what we've done. Look what we've done. Look what we've done. That's where we're at, brother. Uh, it said, but the woman's the glory of the man. Verse 8. Let's keep moving here. Uh, verse 8. Uh, where am I? I missed it here. There it is. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Originally in the garden, man wasn't made from a woman. It's real self-explanatory what he's saying here. The woman is made from the man. Originally, a man didn't come from a woman. A woman came from a man. Boy, don't God mess up the scientists. I mean, that just messes things all to pieces right there. Uh, verse 9, neither was the man created for the woman. Adam wasn't put here to be a helpmeet for her. The Bible said in Genesis chapter 2, that God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a help meet for him. He needs somebody to help meet his needs. So I'm going to make somebody tailor-made just for him. Just for him. I still believe the Lord does that today. I still believe the Lord tailor-makes a woman for every man. 
I do. I believe if you, if you are, if, brother, if you're in the will of God and you married in the will of God and you're serving God with that woman, I believe she was tailor-made just for you. Eve was form, made, and shaped just for him. She, she, God knew what kind of personality Adam had. God knew just exactly what Adam liked. What didn't. God knew everything about Adam. And so he made this woman to complete him, to help meet his needs. I believe there's a spouse out there, whether you're a man or a woman, that's made just for you. Amen. I believe that in the Bible. Uh, verse 9, but neither was the man created for the woman, <coughs> but the woman for the man. Now, man, you tell that to your average, you know, women's liber today, read a verse like that, and they just blow a gasket, strip a clutch out, and go all to pieces, man. Um, <coughs> but that's Bible. I'm just, I'm really not commenting much. I'm just kind of reading the verse here to you. Uh, verse number 10. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. There's not many verses we come to that I don't have a real, I mean, I'm going to give you an educated opinion on this verse, but your guess is good as mine on this one, y'all. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't got a whole lot of light on this thing. I'm going to give you what I got, but I ain't sure what this is about. Verse 10, for this cause, uh, for the cause that the woman is the glory of the man, for the cause that the woman was made from the man, for the cause that man wasn't created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Is it for the cause of verse 7, 8, 9? Is it the cause of the hair issue, verse 5 and 6? I don't know. But this is an interesting verse. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. I, I, the closest thing I can find to it, what in the world has an angel got to do with a woman and her head being covered? I, I, here's the closest thing I'm going to give you that I can get to it. Here's the nearest thing I can get to you. Isaiah chapter 6 said that there was an angelic being called a seraphim. And when that seraphim worships, when he worships God, he does so, and the Bible said he's got wings. And with his wings, the Bible said with two wings he flew, uh, with twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. It said with two wings he covered his feet, with two wings he flew, and with two wings he covered his head. He hit his head when he worshiped. Uh, and then the only other verse I can give you on it is you go study the Ark of the... Uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Go study that Ark. Where they put the tables of the testimony in. Them children of Israel toted it around. The Bible said on top of that Ark was two cherubims. And them cherubims' wings, the Bible said they had their wings on high and their faces were down toward the mercy seat. They covered their head. It was like this. They covered their head when they worshipped. And the Ark is a pattern of what's in the heavenlies. So even when the angelic beings worship, they do so by covering their head. Uh, it's the closest thing I can get to that right there. Maybe you come up with uh, something else and help me with that uh, after Sunday school. But that's the best I can give you on that. What in the world an angel has to do. I know that angels watch the church. I know that. I know the Bible said in 1 Peter that, that angels desire to look into what you have. Uh, Paul said, let me read a verse to you what Paul said in Ephesians here about angels watching stuff. He said in Ephesians 3.10, he said to the intent that now under the principalities and powers, principalities and powers, these are uh, spiritual beings, to the intent now that unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So in other words, these principalities and powers in heavenly places, these angelic beings, they are getting a picture of the power of God through the church. And so I don't know if you realize it this morning, but there are angelic beings in heavenly places that watch what goes on in the congregation. I, I, you say, explain all that. I can't explain all that to you. Um, and that thing about the woman having power on her head because of the angels, that's, that's the closest thing I can get to it. You know, maybe, maybe you get something else from it and, and give it to me. All right, verse number 11, let's move on here. I'm going to try and finish this thing out down to verse 16 if I at all possible can. I want to get to something else next Sunday. Verse 11, nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. Read verse 12 too, both of these verses go together. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. It almost seems like he's contradicting himself, but he's not, and I'm going to tell you why. But all things of God. So in verse 11 he said, nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man. So the woman's not without the man. You was made from a man. But every man since then wasn't without a woman. Everybody in here had a mama. 
There ain't nobody in here didn't have a mama. So originally, yes, the first woman was not without the man. She would come from the man. And the truth is, every woman to this day still come from the seed of a man. But every man living today can't say, I didn't have a mama. Everybody's come from a woman. Uh, thank God for it. Somebody said, where would you men be without us women? We'd be back in the garden having fellowship with God. Hallelujah. <laughs> that's right. That's funny. Amen. Uh, but I like what he says. He ends both verses. He ends verse 11 and verse 12. Even though he showed the distinction of the man and the woman, he showed their distinction. Where the woman comes from, where the man comes from, they both basically come from each other. But look at, look at what he says at the end of verse 11. In the Lord. Look at the end of verse 12. But all things of God. So even though, uh, even though the man has responsibilities to his wife and the wife has responsibilities to her husband, the, the husband's responsibility to the wife is to love her, protect, for, protect her, provide for her. The lady's responsibility to the husband is respect him and submit to him. But both saved people are to submit themselves to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Both saved people, uh, if a real marriage is really going to work, the man and the woman both submit themselves one to another and then submit both themselves to God if it's really going to work. You'll find that in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number uh, 7. All right, now we're going to look at these last few verses here, and this is where the rubber kind of really meets the road. Uh, you know, I, I'm an independent Baptist, but independent Baptists harped on these verses for a long time, sometimes to the detriment of their own self, especially how we'll see how Paul concludes it. Verse 13, judge in yourselves. Once again, bless Paul's heart. He is the most judgmental Christian you'll ever find in the Bible. He all the time saying, judge this, judge that, judge the other. And all these Christians today won't judge nothing because they're scared about being called, you know, judge not that you be not judged. Judge in yourselves. He said, can't you figure this out? Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Now he's about to appeal to their reasoning and common sense in verse 14 and 15. Here it is. Here's the common sense. He asked the question in verse 13. Now he's going to try and appeal to common sense reason in verse 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto... Brother Keith Haynes, how many times did you hear that preached as a young Christian when you was trying to... <laughs> I've talked to Brother Keith before. He said when he got hair, uh, saved, he had that long hair. He said, the old Preacher Carver said he hammered that and hammered it like every service he's in. He hammered on that thing. Oh, man. Like every preacher that came in, You was tough then, man. You was tough. You was tough, I tell you that. You was a glutton for punishment, brother. Uh, but said, doth not even nature itself. Now, when he says nature itself, he's not talking about looking at animals. He's not talking about animal nature. He's not talking about trees and things like that. He, when he says nature, he's talking about natural. Look at the things that are natural. Look at man, look at woman. Doesn't what's natural, doesn't nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Um, so obviously in these texts here, verse 14 and 15, the question then comes up, and you almost can't avoid it. What's long, preacher? And what's short? Now, I'm going I'm to be like Brother Gillum. I'm going to say something real deep here, and I ain't sure all y'all going to get it. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, you really want to get right down to it. The Bible doesn't say, all right, this is when it starts getting long. This is when it starts getting short. Here it is. I will tell you in the context of what he's dealing with, this is long and this is short. It, it, here's the context. When the lines of gender starts being blurred, that's when something's too long or something's too short. For instance, how many of y'all have ever been standing behind some lady in the checkout line and said, oh, excuse me, ma'am, and turned around and it wasn't no ma'am, it was a dude. But he had hair clear on down to here. I'm sorry, sir. That's, the lines have been blurred. How many of y'all, I said, brother, now we're living in a day where it's done gender, uh, blended the lines and gender so much, I have literally, literally been sitting in restaurants before and look at my wife and say, is that a woman or is that a guy sitting over there? Because I can't tell. And turns out it was a woman. Yeah. But her hair was cut up just like mine. And her clothes looked just like mine. And it's all been whoop. Yeah. Brother, that's where we're living at today. We're living in a society 
that the lines have been so blurred, and that and it, it lead, brother, that's you know Romans chapter one. And we're living in, in it said as it was in the days of Sodom, even so. Shall, but what we're doing today is we're taking away the femininity from the women, and we're taking away the masculinity from the men, and we're swapping them. We give the femininity to the man, and we give the masculinity to the women. Have y'all noticed that today? Yeah. I mean, doth not nature itself even teach you this? I mean, when you walk to a bathroom sign. You don't even have to have man on one and woman on one. The picture speaks for itself. Anybody ever walked up to a bathroom sign that didn't have man or didn't have woman? They just had, I've seen some now that's got a head, just a head. And the man's head looks like mine and the lady's head's got long hair. And you say, well, that's the lady's bathroom, that's the man's bathroom. I've seen some that's just a picture, a silhouette of the two. I ain't never walked into the lady's bathroom. I know right off the bat that's a picture of a woman, that's a picture of a man. But we're living in a society that's trying to blur these lines uh, in such a way that's messed up. Now you say, what it, 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 so preacher, where's, where's it long? Where's it short? I, I'm, 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 not, I'm not educated enough. or The Bible doesn't give enough scripture on it to tell you. But I will tell you this. It talks about it being a covering, a covering. It says in the next text, her hair was given her for a covering. And it talks about the man ought not to have, be covered up. You say, what's it covering? What's it covering? I would say when hair covers the man's neck, forehead, and ears, it's done got too long. It's covered the head area. That's what I'd say. Um, these boys nowadays, uh, it's getting now to where the hairstyles, have you noticed how more and more and more boys now, the hairstyle is for it to come down like this? And it's constantly... I wish I'd have went into the chiropractor business when I was younger, because brother, this next generation's gonna need serious neck therapy. Because all these young boys do walk around. You know, you'd save yourself a lot of neck trouble if you did whoop. You know, that big a deal. But you know, here's, here's the funny thing about it, and I'm, you know, like I say, independent Baptist, and I am one, uh, but I'll never forget, and I'll not name his name, he's a great man of God, dead gone to heaven now. But man, when my daddy first got saved, my daddy, you know, he was still just trying to get, you know, in the right path and all that. And daddy hadn't, you know, got, you know, some things sanctified. And uh, daddy had hair that come, you know, down up over his ears and all that, which whatever. And he was out to eat with that fellow one night. And that fellow said something about daddy's long hair and picking on him about it, you know, trying to shame him. And that fellow had that truck driver special. Now, he was the preacher. He had this truck driver special. To where it was, back in the old days, you know, like Barney Fife, they'd slick it back. You know what I'm talking about? The old days where they'd take that comb and slick it back like that, the old style. Daddy said, well, if you used to comb yours forward, it'd hang down to your bless God chin. <laughs> I mean, you know, in that kind of, hey, hello, pot, my name's Kettle. <laughs> you know, all kind of ways around this thing, all kind of ways around this thing. Anyways, uh... I told you it was an interesting subject. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. Uh, it, it, it's, took, it's took your masculinity away. It's a shame to you. Verse 15, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given her for a covering. And so that's, that's what I got on that thing. Now, if you want to talk about, you know, is there really a difference between men's hair and women's hair? Absolutely, as the King James Bible denotes that there is. Uh, you ought to read Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. As a matter of fact, turn with me. We just, we're fixing to close out here. I'll let you look at it. Revelation chapter 9. Even the Holy Ghost gives us a distinction here. Revelation 9 and verse number 7. Here's these, uh, these mutant uh, monsters come out of the bottomless pit during the great tribulation period uh, to sting men. And watch what the Bible says about them. Watch this distinction thing that it gives. Verse 7. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were as it were crowns like gold. Their faces were as the faces of men. Verse 8. And they had hair as the hair of women. So they got a face like a man, but however their hair looks, it's hair like a woman. And obviously this thing is a mutant. I mean, brother, look at what it says. Teeth like lines, uh, breastplates of iron, wings, uh, as the sound of chariots and horses running to battle, tails like scorpions. It's some sort of mutant. And so even the Holy Ghost dictates the fact that if it's a man, it ought to look like a man. If it's a woman, it ought to look like a woman. 
And, uh, but then watch what Paul says. I told you this was an interesting thing. Look how Paul ends this. He gives a 10-verse discourse on this covering and on this head thing. And then watch how the Holy Ghost ends it. This is why I'm not real dogmatic on this thing. You want to know why I'm not real dogmatic on it? Because the Bible's not super dogmatic on it. Look how he ends it in verse 16. Don't miss this. 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen. 16. But if any man seem to be contentious, if you just want to fuss and fight and moan and groan, if that's all you're going to do about it, if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, <laughs> neither the churches of God. Paul, for 10 verses, you go into great detail on this thing, and at the end, you just back up and say, but if y'all just going to fuss and fight over it, just forget it. <laughs> okay, then. So you say, preacher, where do you fall on it? I fall right where Paul did. I think nature itself teaches you if a man have long hair, it's a shame to him. If a woman have long hair, it's her glory. But if you're just going to fuss and fight and get all bent out of shape about it and blow up, I ain't fussing and fighting about it. <laughs> to me, it ain't worth losing fellowship and losing the people of God over But brother, listen here. I know a lot of Baptists, they didn't read verse 16. <laughs> I know a lot of Baptists, they never read verse 16, obviously. Or if they read verse 16, they thought verse 16 said, and if anybody disagrees with you, just bless God, cut them up left and right, make them feel like a servant, sorry, good for nothing, low down, rotten heel, until they finally leave the church. I think that's the way some Baptists read verse 16. That is not the way verse 16 is read. Verse 16 is read, if you're going to be contentious about it, and it's just going to cause a big fuss and a big fight, just, we have no custom, neither the churches of God. Don't worry about it. In other words, Paul said, I'm trying to give you some good guidelines to go by, trying to give you some good stuff that'll help you. But if, all you, if it's going to turn into some big old blow up and brouhaha, man, it ain't worth ruining the people of God. That basically, I'll tell you what that is, and we've looked at this in Corinthians. I'm done right here. It goes back to what Paul said in another place. He said, for meat, destroy not thy brother. Talking about how, whether should you eat this meat or not eat this meat. And he said, if it's going to destroy my brother that I eat this meat, I just won't eat it. And so when it gets to stuff like that, if, if me you know, railing on something is going to destroy some brother or sister in the Lord, I just, just leave it alone. It's not like it. we're talking about some major doctrine of the faith. I, I believe that is one place where, brother, some people have majored on the minors and minored on the majors. And I'm going to try and keep the main thing the main thing, preach the Bible. Uh, but some of this sidebar stuff, I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to hammer on it because the Bible doesn't. All right, let's break. Father, we thank you so much for the scripture. And God, thank you so much, Lord, uh, for helping us this morning. And as we study through these verses, I pray that we take it and give us a desire to study more. God, help us to be different in this world. Help us, Lord, to shine our light in this world so they know there's something different about God's people. And Lord, we'll thank you for it. Help us now in the 11 o'clock. Bless the choir and the preaching and all that's done. We'll give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty.